Hello, everybody. As many of you know and have messaged me uh, on December 14th, 2021, last Tuesday, there was a fatal helicopter crash in New Orleans on the Bonnie Carey Spillway involving a Bell 407. Uh, unfortunately, the pilot was fatally injured during the mishap. As I shared in my Facebook page, uh, Lester was actually asked to speak to the local news as the aviation expert to discuss it. Weather conditions at the time included some fog and low clouds, at least here. And I think when the gentleman that actually took off from Gonzales, uh, he, he had good weather. And then when he hit the cause um, the spillway area, the ceiling dropped a lot. And as you know, I don't like to speculate on the cause of mishaps prior to the investigation being completed, which the NTSB will take their uh, time to investigate the possible causes. There were a couple of factors that were present, such as weather uh, that Lester mentioned and uh, some other things. But uh, it got me thinking about what Lester said about land and live. It, it's called land and live. In other words, when you do run to a fog bank, there's, there's questions on if you should turn back or keep going through it. And he actually recommended uh, the 56 Seconds to Live video. Um, as you know, I've partnered with Helicopter Association International uh, to kind of promote helicopter safety and for me to learn the industry. I'm a fixed wing guy by trade. I've been a fighter pilot my whole career. I just started flying helicopters last year uh, and was only introduced to helicopters at all in the last couple of years. It, so it's very new to me. Uh, I took the course 56 Seconds to Live, which I highly recommend. It's a very good course. Uh, it starts out with a video that you can actually watch on their YouTube channel. And it's about a pilot that is making a go-no-go -no -go decision. And the weather is not so great. And he's flying to a new customer. He's got to get some parts 50 miles away. And he's like, nope, if I canceled every time, I would probably never fly. So he takes off into the weather, deteriorating conditions and ends up having a mishap um, due to spatial disorientation inadvertent uh, into instrument, instrument meteorological conditions, which is kind of similar to the Kobe Bryant mishap uh, inadvertent IMC, and it is a very big cause of a lot of mishaps with helicopters. So the courseware itself is really good because it takes that uh, fictional mishap and breaks it down into a lot of things which I like and I agree with. They do one thing uh, called the FRATS, which is a flight risk assessment uh, that basically uh, gives you a score on the various parts of the flight and external factors that could add up to make you pause and decide, well, I'm not going to fly. It's kind of like what we do in fighters, which is the operational risk management matrix. So basically, you know, you get a couple points for the weather's not great, a couple points for I didn't sleep last night, a couple points for I'm pressured to fly this flight. And if the score adds up to a certain number, then either it's like, okay, I need to be more cautious, maybe plan this more, or hey, I need to cancel the flight altogether. So it's just one more tool. They have a couple other tools that they talk about in the course, uh, like setting personal weather minimums, setting personal airspeed and altitude minimum. So if you go below these two numbers, then hey, I'm, I'm gonna turn around. And then they give you options, you know, whether you uh, land and live, which is what Lester talks about, which is something that's kind of new to me as a fixed wing guy, right? We never can just land and wait out weather. It's usually, hey, I've got to declare an emergency and go somewhere. Uh, you actually diverting like you would in a fixed wing, uh, declaring an emergency and getting a, an IFR clearance, uh, climbing, or uh, turning around and going back home where it's clear. Uh, I know this applies to fixed wing, uh, general aviation, specifically people without instrument ratings. You know, I think it's 100 and something seconds to live on the, the aviation side. I've never seen that. I've always been instrument rated as a military pilot. I did fly some civilian prior to that, but, uh, and I've had my share of, you know, when I was a civilian pilot, I did some scud running a couple times. I'm not going to say I've never tried it, but uh, it's definitely not advisable. But in the helicopter world, to me, as somebody who's brand new to it, it does seem like it's more of a culture. Uh, there's more of a willingness to fly lower, try to stay below the weather, uh, try to, uh, an aversion to fly instruments. You know, some of the things I've noticed, and this is a discussion, right? So before I get into the discussion part, uh, I will make the pitch though, uh, Heli Expo will have this course actually in person, 56 seconds to live. Uh, that's March 7th through 10th 
uh, in Dallas. Uh, early bird registration is right now, so uh, until January 14th. So if you want to sign up for that, go to their website, sign up. I think they give you a discount for the early bird registration, but uh, you can come out. We can talk. I'll be there uh, with the safety folks of HAI. Uh, I'll be meeting all the manufacturers and stuff and just hanging out and, and learning more about flying helicopters. So good chance to meet me, good chance to see all the others in the industry and, and kind of check it out. And we'll have this discussion. This is something that I'm wanting to learn more about because this was a mishap that hit home. I did know the pilot that was involved in the mishap. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to speculate the cause, but like anybody else, you know, I looked at the ADSB, I, I looked at the weather conditions at the time, I looked at the equipment on the aircraft, and there's a lot of factors that just make you scratch your head. So I'm really interested to see what the report's going to say. But in the meantime, it's it's a good opportunity for us to pause and kind of take assessment of, you know, are we doing things right as helicopter pilots? Are we doing things right in general? Is there anything, any way we can learn from this now and be safer? And in my research, you know, one of the things I noticed is it's a lot more restrictive to fly instruments in helicopters. You know, uh, for a fixed wing private pilot, you know, I remember back when I got my PPL way back in the day, you had to wear the foggles at least for a little bit and be moderately proficient in simulated IMC just to get your PPL. Um, now, granted, that was almost 20 years ago, but there was some proficiency. I don't think, at least for my add-on, there was no simulated instrument time for my PPL. And I was looking at the commercial and the only simulated instrument time, there's five hours, but it can be in anything. It can be in an aircraft. It doesn't have to be in a helicopter. So um, a basic commercial pilot flying helicopters might not have any instrument flying experience. And even those that get their instrument rating, I hear this a lot where guys are like, well, what's the point of having an instrument rating when you can't use it? And I was confused by that. I'm like, what do you mean you can't use it? Use it. And it's like, well, because helicopters are not instrument certified. So I went and was looking into what is required for instrument certification. And it's very uh, strict. You know, it's not like a fixed wing aircraft, which basically you have to have a, a working pedostatic system, essentially, and ability to fly approaches. For helicopters, you have to have uh, stability augmentation system or an autopilot. It, it's, it makes it so that only basically large helicopters or very advanced or very expensive helicopters can do it, which is confusing to me because like I fly the R44 Raven 2, that's got a Garmin 430. It's got an ADI. It's got an HSI. It's got all of the things I would need. If I had that panel in a Cessna 172, I could go fly an instrument approach all day long. But because it's not instrument certified, I can only practice. I can do my check ride in it. I can never fly an IMC in it. And I think one of the things this drives, which is the discussion, which again, I'm new to this. I have all of 69 hours in helicopters. So I am by no means an expert. I'm not trying to change the world. I'm just asking the question. One of the things that in my mind is it's instrument flying is a proficiency thing. It's a use or lose thing. I, we have to maintain proficiency in flying fighters in instrument approaches. Uh, the T-38A is the most difficult aircraft I've ever flown in instruments. And that's because, well, one, the gauges are not all that friendly. Two, they may not even be re working reliable, reliably. We've had issues with that. And three, you know, you're a 300 knot airplane with no autopilot flying single pilot in instruments. It's tough. It's not, it's not easy. So it's something that you have to maintain a proficiency at. And so I understand the argument against, hey, you know, single pilot IFR is just tough, but I don't think that is the deal breaker. So what it almost seems like to me is happening is uh, pilots get their uh, instrument rating because it's a check in the square. You know, hey, I need this for the job and then never use it because, well, nothing I fly will ever fly IMC conditions, which then creates an aversion to flying an IMC. So they would rather scud run or try to push the limits, fly lower. I, that's one thing I have heard from a lot of people I've talked to is, well, I'll just fly lower. You know, I, I can I can fly lower. You know, that's the whole beauty of helicopters and stuff. They don't, like my first instinct as a fixed wing guy, especially a single seat fighter pilot that's, you know, from the F-16 days is, you know, climb to cope. You know, if I have a problem, I climb. And I don't have a problem transitioning to instruments because it's a little bit, it's, it's, it's second nature to me. Versus... You know, some of the old school helicopter guys I've talked to, they're like, well, I get lower. You know, I'll fly lower. Uh, it's it's not a problem. And then you get into these inadvertent and IMC conditions where 
they're just not proficient because they haven't been doing it. They haven't practiced. They haven't gone out and practiced approaches. They haven't gone out and practiced, you know, with the foggles or in a simulator or something. So they're not used to just flying off instruments in the helicopter uh, where, you know, your senses can lie to you. You know, you, you can't just fly seat, seat of the pants at that point. Now you have to, no kidding, have your cross check, your ADI, your airspeed, uh, velocity vector, or sorry, your VVI, if you have a velocity vector on a, a new panel, but uh, you have to cross check all these things. So it, I, I'm wondering, and this is, like I said, for the comments, is it is it a culture thing where rules from the FAA, which has basically created a situation where it's, you don't have a helicopter that can fly instruments, so why bother, has created a less safe scenario because people go inadvertent in IMC trying to avoid IMC in the first place. And now they're in these situations that they can't get out of. And so that was one of the nice things about the 56 seconds to live video is it does give you some tools to kind of get, you know, cage your brain on how to, how to deal with that stuff. But I wonder if there's just a way that we can avoid it from ever happening, you know, where it's not a big deal. You know, if like if that R44 I had were I have IFR certified, it'd be no problem. Just, Hey, I'm going to get a pop-up clearance no problem, get through the weather, get climbed or whatever, and then cancel and then continue about my thing versus it being an emergency because I just went inadvertent into IMC. So um, that's just a discussion. Like I said, I'm, I'm by no means an expert in helicopter flying after 69 hours. It's just, you know, I'm new and I, I, I really, you know, might be looking at it from a new perspective, might be just, you know, okay, hey, it's already been tried, sorry, um, you know, shut up, mover. That's fine. But uh, I do highly recommend you taking the course. I highly recommend, you know, going to Heli Expo. Uh, it will be there in person. Uh, I think the, uh, the 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 people that put it on, like Chris Hill, will be there to answer questions and stuff like that. So it'll be a really good uh, good time. And, you know, we'll get to hang out and talk about helicopter flying. But uh, very sad mishap uh, in general. You know, anytime any mishap is sad. But this is just one of those things where, you know, it, it's – it's tough because, you know, you, you look at it from the outside and you go, they had all the tools they needed to be successful. I wonder what happened. And from that point on, you know, the NTSB will, uh, will put those puzzle, put those pieces of the puzzle together and hopefully come up with an answer. So, uh, anyway, um, let me know what you think in the comments. This is a open discussion. Like I said, I don't know the answer. This will probably be part of a a series, I guess. So, you know, we'll talk about this more when I go to Heli Expo and do the uh, 56 seconds to live in person. Uh, I'll do some videos uh, flying, you know, simulated instruments in the simulator over there as well. And I'll show you, you know, we'll talk to some of the experts and kind of see. So this is just the beginning of what hopefully be a, a much more in-depth safety series. So that'll be uh, something to look forward to in 2022. I hope you'll enjoy it. Thank you for watching. Sign up for Heli Expo. I'll see you next time.